Okay, dear colleagues and dear guests, good afternoon and welcome to Eurasia Research Institute's monthly seminar. The speaker of today's seminar is uh, Dr. Alvina Muratbekova. Uh, Dr. Muratbekova is going to make a presentation on the topic of uh, geopolitical shifts in Eurasia, recent developments and cooperation opportunities. Uh, let me introduce uh, briefly for the guests, not our colleagues. Uh, Dr. Murat Bekova is uh, one of the uh, senior researchers at the Eurasian Research Institute, uh, Central Asia, Asia Pacific, especially uh, India, China, and uh, Japan are uh, priority regions and countries uh, among her fields of study. Uh, well, uh, before uh, giving the floor, uh, to Dr. Murat Bekova, I would like to <coughs> say a couple of words about the topic. Uh, as we see, uh, as we can observe, uh, the Russian-Ukrainian uh, war has uh, heightened uh, conflicts and confrontation in the international scene. Uh, the world has been uh, experiencing uh, actually an unusual shift uh, for a while maybe more than uh, two uh, years, we are observing uh, very dramatical change and shift in the international scene. Uh, some experts uh, call uh, this shift as a disordered uh, multipolar world, or uh, some call this uh, international scene as a chaotic uh, multipolar world. It can be changeable uh, from expert to expert. But uh, this is uh, actually disordered multipolar world. In this new geopolitics, uh, we see that China and India are emerging uh, as a new actors uh, alongside uh, United States and Russia. And this is the reality. Uh, these developments are called a series of radical changes in terms of uh, foreign policy approaches, in terms of uh, reestablishing uh, alliances, uh, realignment uh, process, and uh, security uh, perceptions, and also uh, the prosperity of using nuclear weapons. And finally, uh, we can uh, include the food and energy security issues to these uh, new uh, possibilities and issues. Yeah, there are a lot of to say, but uh, <clears throat> now uh, I'm going to give the floor to uh, Dr. Murat Bekova to listen and to get further information and uh, for detailed uh, evolution. Yes, uh, Dr. Murat Bekova, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you can start your presentation. Please go on. Thank you very much. So Let me start this. Yes, it works, right? Then my slides. Yes. It is okay. Working. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, as as uh, Dr. Swarbe have told, uh, so today I'm going to speak about the geopolitical shifts in Eurasia, recent developments, and cooperation opportunities. So we now uh, we all know that we are now facing uh, the uh, um, as uh, the majority of leaders are calling unprecedented uh, shifts in the world uh, system and uh, which is basically influenced by a number of factors uh, among them is the most influ uh, is uh, the most significant one is the ukrainian war so today my presentations is going to be around uh, four major topics first of all would be the ukrainian war so i would like uh, to elaborate how this uh, the war in the eastern europe had affected um, different parts of the world and how this uh, the um, implications of this of this this world are influencing to the politics of uh, different nations from uh, diverse perspectives, including food, energy, and other uh, perspectives. Then I'm going to, uh, to disclose about the China's rivalry, in particular rivalry with the US and with the EU and other countries. Uh, then I would like to pay some attention to the Asian countries, what's the role uh, Asian countries are uh, playing in this process. And uh, in, at the conclusion, uh, I would speak a, li a little about uh, the um, prospects of Central Asian states in this process. 
Uh, so first, let me start with the geopolitical shifts affected by the war in Ukraine. So we know that uh, the, the war which started last February had affected uh, multiple, multiple spheres, among them uh, the Question number one uh, with the uh, uh, Putin's uh, uh, administration's uh, at, uh, activities and uh, invasion to Ukraine. Uh, so first of all, uh, the world community nowadays it, uh, has been questioning the issue of the credibility of the UN char Charter and the fundamental international law. So why it is uh, this the war is uh, the war in Ukraine is important and what is the difference of this war from the other uh, war? Wars happening uh, during the last decades. So the major difference: four years uh, had finished uh, in, uh, thirty years ago. Uh, so since then, we were living in the era of globalization and uh, um, uh, the in in the uh, one polar polar world and all these things. But however. Uh, the situation in Ukraine was the different. The major difference of this world war was that uh, first of all, is this it had um, the question of the uh, it had violated the fundamental uh, issue uh, uh, international law. Why uh, first of all the invasion by invading uh, Ukraine, uh, Russia had included its uh, conquered territory as part of the Russian Federation. So this first of all violates the fundamental laws of uh, I. I of the world. Uh, secondly, the credibility of the UN Charter. So uh, the question is whether the UN char Charter works. With this invasion, we all the, uh, are asking, should this UN Charter has to be uh, reformed or it should be transformed to a different uh, uh, form or uh, should the uh, UN itself be reformed and uh, questions like this. Why is because of the uh, role of the UN General Secretary uh, playing during the war in Ukraine. So if we come, uh, if we look at the um, activities of the uh, Guterres, uh, the UN uh, General Secretary, and if, if we compare it to the activities of the previous uh, UN General Secretaries during the uh, more or less similar conflicts, for instance, during the Cuba crisis, when the uh, UN General Secretary Utan uh, was deeply involved in the conflict, and uh, he um, immediately went to the conflict side, crisis side and was there until the uh, major tensions were decreased. So the other example could be Kofi Annan's case, who also, uh, in during the um, highest tensions in the Syria conflict in 2012, was also uh, participated in the mediation process. In comparison to this uh, UN General Secretaries, secretaries, what is the role of uh, uh, Antonio Guterres uh, during this uh, Ukrainian crisis? So there is uh, there is a discussions and debates uh, about the decreasing the role of the UN as a global governance organization and the, the major organizations which is um, which is responsible for uh, keeping uh, ensuring the mediation processes and all the things. So this is the uh, the second issue uh, which was rising uh, with the war in Ukraine is the coalition of the West. So uh, we are now facing the unprecedented uh, political unity of the uh, European Union in response to the war. Uh, so if before uh, last year we wait what the fractions uh, within the EU uh, spe speculated you am I my connection fine uh, yes okay I'm continuing Sorry. sometimes yeah sometimes it's uh, yeah. going bad but now it's okay you can go on. <clears throat> the second issue is the coalition of the West. So before uh, last year, we were experiencing uh, the debates about the fractions within the EU system, uh, deglobalization processes, and uh, decision to uh, resume from the Paris Agreement. So all, then uh, the Brexit uh, had the Brexit happened. And all the things. Uh, speculated the, uh, the fractions within the Western uh, nations. Uh, however, uh, the war in Ukraine had uh, le led to the coalition of the West, and uh, uh, we are now seeing the unity 
equity in response response uh, response to the world budget. So if for the um, uh, the the, war, the European peace facility uh, was uh, operating. However, due to the opening of the war, the European Union countries they had increased the budget uh, five times more than before. Uh, so now uh, the budget of uh, the uh, European peace, uh, the budget which uh, the European Union had sent to Ukraine through its uh, European peace facility is already reached 2.5 billion euros. A uh, similar large budget was sent by the US uh, to Ukraine, which is now uh, reached over $1 billion. What we are seeing from the public in the uh, in the in EU US is the unilateral um, support of the uh, of Ukraine and the unilateral um uh, unity in uh, um, in uh, competing with uh, the, the, to helping to, uh, to to support the Ukraine in, uh, and the being against the measures taken by Russia. Uh, what else we are seeing nowadays is the shift of Asia and Africa. So according to the UN General Assembly resolutions, so, uh, so far they had six resolutions on Russian invasion. First was after 2014 uh, Crimea invasion and others was uh, since the beginning of the war. So what we can see, first of all, is that most abstentions are, are coming from the African states, 51%. So what is uh, what it says about, it says that uh, now we are coming back to the default uh, position of the African countries, which were held during the Cold War times. Uh, then we are seeing that um, the Asian countries are also uh, not always supporting the processes happening, uh, the, not always supporting the, uh, the sanctions against Russia. So for instance, China was times against and four times up six times and Iran was abstained uh, once uh, against two and uh, was absent three times. So this is the major power. So China and India being the largest um, nations in the world and uh, uh, being the most powerful in Asia, we are seeing how this uh, the shift of the balance uh, uh, happening in the world uh, for the world uh, order. Uh, then uh, so then we are going, uh, we are also facing the reassessment of security and defense. Uh, so first of all, we can, uh, we are witnessing the changing infrastructure of European, of the European security and NATO. So given that uh, NATO, uh, which consists of 13 nations, out of which 28 are European nations, first of all, it had affected the uh, arch security architecture of the Euro of Europe. Uh, so uh, the um, this week, we uh, the Finland had joined NATO. So uh, the fact the the step which was impossible one year ago now became reality. So now NATO had expanded towards uh, eastern direction, uh, and now uh, the borders, uh, the distance from the NATO states to uh, Russia is only one hundred and fifty uh, kilometers. Uh, so now uh, there is an uh, also uh, the um, uh, common unity in and the desire uh, aspire to include uh, Sweden in this process. Uh, so in general, uh, this is uh, besides uh, the expansion of the NATO, we are also witnessing the uh, changing um, structures within the NATO system. So they are also trying to reform and the paying. Uh, so if, uh, so uh, before, uh, during the last 30 years, uh, everybody was sure that there is no going to be a major war, war between the states nowadays, uh, the perceptions of the countries and the, their different systems had also changed. So it also led to the changing architecture of the European system in overall. Uh, it also led to the increase in defense budget, um, it is seen from the increasing budgets of the European states. In particular, uh, Germany had increased its uh, but defense budget to up to uh, two percent of its GDP. Uh, France and other countries are also uh, attempting to um, increase their um, defense budgets and also are uh, reconsidering the uh, defense uh, strategies. Uh, the the security system also had uh, touched upon the countries of Asia Pacific, so. 
for instance, the, um, in particular, the countries of Indo-Pacific Taiwan Strait uh, became uh, more interested by the uh, the uh, partners, uh, the Western or European partners. Sorry. Uh, so, in the Pacific, the, the, there is much more um, activities uh, in partnership with the Indo-Pacific states. Uh, so, we are seeing this increasing interest in the Taiwan Strait and. Uh, uh, Consequences of this region. Uh, then we have another threat, which are uh, spoken uh, during the last year. It's about the nuclear threat. So the okay, sorry. So the uh, nuclear threat is um, since the last year. We are frequently uh, so there was several times when Putin was uh, threatening about the uh, implications of the nuclear war and then uh, there was in multiple discussions from the western side how the west should react to this uh, to, to react and response to this uh, nuclear threats then uh, so uh, Joe Biden said that uh, this nuclear threat has again come to the forefront of discussions and uh, um, all this, uh, this uh, debates and discussions are also uh, by having all these discussions from the one side the countries are also uh, preparing for the reactions uh, from the other hand. Um, another um, features of the uh, recent ongoing uh, changes is covered by the cyber warfare and the drone wars. So uh, the war in Ukraine also uh, show the difference of the using of cyber warfares, uh, in particular in the use of uh, social media and the information attacks. So we know that um, the, the advancement of the inform uh, information systems has been developed, uh, which is uh, clearly seen in the case of uh, the Ukraine conflict. First of all, it we see from the uh, tools of propaganda, uh, tools of uh, mass information about how the, the first ongoing uh, developments uh, within the war. Then we are uh, seeing how knowledge has been used for um, as a tool of the uh, in the military battlefields. For instance, uh, the war in Ukraine showed uh, how the social media could be used in these processes. For instance, uh, while discussing with these uh, Ukrainian refugees, I have heard multiple times so that they, um, so from the refugees who came from this hotspot, they were uh, sharing that uh, why the information in the Ukraine they are not. Um, uh, they are not uh, uploading everything uh, like uh, uh, on the because uh, there is an information should be should not be shared at uh, like once it happened is because for instance uh, there was a stories like uh, if for instance the the uh the russian intelligence they could uh, hear the uh, hear this uh information and they could react uh, first uh, rather than uh, ukrainian army could uh, protect their fields so all these things also uh, shows how the cyber war uh, has been used during the uh, warfares and also another um, aspect of this uh, advancements of IT technologies is the how uh, drone wars are, has uh, is uh, being used uh, in this war. So we know, we know that drone became not only as an um, as an pilotless uh, tool for uh, tracking the places, but also uh, they could also have an uh, had could attack and uh, could also uh, it is an uh, became one of the new. Uh, technologies, uh, pilotless technologies, uh, which would uh, also have a, a very high efficiency in um, in combating the in the battlefields. So the other uh, sphere which were also uh, affected by this uh, Ukrainian war is uh, is we are now uh, we are seeing the energy and fruit food crisis. So the Ukraine showed that uh, the they ha it had uh, unpacked the energy crisis in Europe. It had unpacked how uh, uh, Europe has been depending has been dependent on Russia in terms of its oil and gas exports and uh, other um, uh, resources. So uh, what did the Europeans do? They had. Um, 
accelerated the process of diversification and they had uh, already shifted uh, their major energy uh, exports uh, towards the other regions, including in, in um, oh, sorry, of the Europe in this uh, energy crisis, is that first of all, they, they learned two lessons. The lesson number one was that uh, uh, Europe should not be the one country in uh, in developing its um, in its energy strategy. The uh, the So yes, uh, the, uh, I was speaking of, uh, talking about the, how energy crisis affected uh, Europe. So first of all, the the Europe had learned that uh, they no, should not rely on one country. So they should reduce their dependency on one country, and they should diversify their energy exports. The number two lesson was that uh, they, while advancing, uh, so while uh, transforming their energy roads. They also changed their policy. Uh, the uh, policy towards the renewable energy. What they did is that by transforming their uh, energy roads, they also um, transformed their system toward the renewable energy uh, sphere. So for this, uh, we can say that. Um, if before the war, uh, the EU uh, were attempted to reach uh, by 2030 40% of uh, to reduce its uh, uh, emissions to 40% and uh, uh, to uh, to have 32% uh, of its economy uh, being uh, based on a renewable energy. Uh, with the war, they had changed this policy, and now their target target is to reach 47% of their economy based on the renewable energy. So this was a uh, shift. And the second shift is about uh, food sustainability. Uh, so the uh, issue here is that the uh, increasing of the prices due to the, to the energy crisis also lead to the uh, uh, ra raising the prices of, of uh, food and livestock. It also uh, that uh, both Russia uh, and the Ukraine being the major exporters of agricultural fertilizers, so and uh, the disruption of the global uh, food uh, food supply changes, it also lead to the from the one hand increase of the prices but for the other hand it also threatened to the shortage of the uh, products so that's why the countries are uh, tried now uh, nowadays are more speaking about the food, food sustainability and in order to prevent uh, food crises because uh, the the beginning of the, the initial, initial time to, of the war also showed that uh, there could be food crisis because uh, because of the dependence on the energy products coming from both uh, from Russia and then um, given that uh, Russia and Ukraine are the major uh, suppliers of uh, foods fertilizer commodities and also uh, 85% of the grain uh, imported to the African countries are coming from mostly from this region. So all these things also caused um, the, the debates on food sustainability. And now um, the countries are advancing their positions and uh, paying more attention to the issues of uh, food and energy security. Uh, so uh, the other factor which is which are going nowadays is the uh, China issue. So uh, if from the one hand we are seeing that um, the crisis in Ukraine also caused this uh, the anti-Russian sentiments all around the world. From the other hand, we also have the situation with China, and uh, as the Europeans say, whatever happens, China wins. Uh, why they say is uh, first of all because uh, out of one hundred and ninety-three nations uh, all around the world, uh, 120 countries are uh, considered China as uh, they are top trading partners. So dependency of all, like uh, majority of nations all around the, the world on China became, um, became more clear. Um, it, it, 
The second uh, question is about this the renewable energy. Although uh, European Union or uh, in, uh, hi highlighted its in its agenda and also are uh, aspiring to move toward the renewable energy uh, in its economy, uh, we all know that 70% uh, of the uh, world's uh, solar plant panels are produced in China. China, on uh, on the other hand, uh, produce 27% uh, uh, of the carbon emissions in the world. So the share of European Union uh, in the carbon emissions is only uh, less than 10%, uh, while uh, China almost reached China, uh, reached almost uh, 30%, and um, uh, the other countries also reached uh, 30%. Uh, US also uh, has had uh, quite significant large share of uh, carbon emissions. Uh, so uh, what uh, we are seeing in the China's policy uh, strategy towards uh, other countries is that it's in its external policies is first of all is that China learns lessons from Russia. So from the one hand, we are uh, saying that uh, see, we are seeing that, uh, for instance, from the Xi Jinping's visit last week to Moscow, we are seeing that uh, from the one hand, uh, Xi Jinping is supporting uh, Russia, uh, sympathizing, not supporting, but sympathizing sympathizing Putin's um, uh, activities uh, in challenging the Western uh, patterns. But on the other hand, as we see uh, like is, uh, yesterday, the EU uh, ambassador said that uh, Russia, oh, sorry, China is not supporting the war uh, in uh, Russian aggression and the uh, um, China is not uh, supporting Russia from not military nor military nor economically, and uh, it is uh, condemning uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, China also capitalizing uh, from the Russia's uh, sanctions. Uh, so it's, uh, for instance, it became among the larger importers of Russian. Uh, Russian oil, and it had signed a new agreement for the next uh, 30 years. It also has other agreements, and uh, we can uh, we know that the trade between two countries had already increased since the war times. Uh, internally and in, in external in, in its external policies, uh, China also reassessing its geopolitical strategies. Uh, it also includes uh, Taiwan, uh, which uh, CIA warned that China has plans to take Taiwan by 2027. Uh, so it is. Nowadays, this became among the speculator topics because, because um, CIA, uh, before the war in Ukraine, three days before the war in Ukraine, in, during the Munich conference, also um, warned that uh, Russia will invade uh, Ukraine. And uh, given this uh, prognosis, uh, nowadays, uh, the other countries like the US are. Um, taking into action uh, this, uh, the warns from coming from CIA. Uh, on the other hand, US also uh, using this situation and uh, which is which we can also see from this uh, frequent visits of uh, US senior uh, officials to Taiwan, which took place like last year, uh, very recently, which also um, shows that uh, US trying to understand it, like to see uh, China's reactions to this uh, high level visits. Uh, so uh, the place of East Asia and Indo-Pacific, what Asia is playing uh, in, uh, what's Asia's role in these processes? So uh, firstly, I can say that uh, we see that the, lar the largest economies of Asia, China, India, they are trying to attempt, uh, they are trying to capitalize uh, from these geopolitical shifts. Uh, they, both of them are not um, vocally condemning Russia. On the other hand, uh, India depends um, depends heavily on Russian defense uh, infrastructure. Uh, China has very good uh, relation economically and politically with uh, Russia. So, but on, it's, therefore they became among the larger export, um, trading partners and they also trying to capitalize from the sanctions uh, to against Russia. Uh, we also can see Japan's more assertive diplomacy, which is seen from the Kushida's visit of uh, Ukraine last week. Also, uh, during the time when Xi Jinping was in Moscow, uh, Kushida went to uh, to to uh, Kiev, uh, which is uh, could be uh, featured as the more assertive diplomacy of the Japan's, Japanese government. Uh, 
Uh, this is also related to the fact that Japan this year is uh, uh, taking the presidentship in the G7 and the, it was the only country which hadn't uh, visited uh, Ukraine. And now uh, it's uh, Kushida's visit coincided with the Xi Jinping's visit uh, to Moscow. Um, then we can see the other countries like Turkey, uh, the attempts to me mediate in these processes and the uh, um, Turkey made uh, significant steps in a uh, green deal between uh, uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. Then uh, we see attempts from Xi Jinping, uh, which had proposed a 12-point uh, peace plan, and uh, they both uh, see themselves as in uh, being um, friends of Putin and uh, not being involved in to any side, uh, trying to mediate in this process, uh, in these processes and uh, seeing themselves as an interlocutors of uh, these processes. Uh, we're also uh, seeing the increasing interest in the ASEAN and the uh, emerging Asian states. Um, ASEAN, of course, was always a very significant factor in the Asia-Pacific uh, affairs. However, uh, relations with ASEAN, ASEAN countries uh, had uh, also um, reached to uh, like new uh, heights because uh, the country, the uh, states are trying to diversify their uh, partnership networks, uh, and in. And we are seeing that, uh, the increasing role of Asia in these processes. Uh, so uh, also one more factor I think uh, significant is that BRICS overtake it, uh, G7 in its global GDP. So it means that the emerging countries in comparison to the developed countries also um, became, uh, uh, increased their uh, value in the global uh, economy. It also could say that uh, uh, the BRICS countries also counts the largest uh, populations in the world, so their share is much more larger than the developed uh, nations. Uh, so how these processes uh, will influence to the Central Asian affairs? Uh, first of all, uh, my point of view is that uh, all Central Asian states, uh, besides uh, Turkmenistan, which are uh, take, uh, keeping its neutrality, uh, still are following the multi-vector diplomacy policies. And uh, what we can do in this uh, unprecedented geopolitical shifts in the world is uh, to continue these processes further. and. Uh, uh, to diversify our partnership networks. Uh, so the good, uh, the um, I think the most uh, important thing, uh, the important um, factor in our uh, foreign affairs is that we are not uh, choosing one or two countries as a major partners in our policy, but uh, having more balanced approaches to, towards uh, the whole country, to, to the um, different parts of the world. So we have, we need to keep continuing this uh, multi-vector policy uh, forward. forward. Uh, another, fact, another thing I think we have to follow is that uh, to intensify uh, our regional integration. So the regional integration processes, which started uh, in 2017 with the change of the Uzbek uh, uh, president, uh, was started before the war, but I think that the uh, since the last year, uh, with these uh, changes, geopolitical shifts all around the world, uh, we are seeing the importance of uh, regional integration. So, what we can do as a region, given that Central Asia region for um, as a region still has a very small market, for instance, uh, the share of Central Asia as a uh, in trade uh, market with other countries, EU, uh, China, India, uh, Japan, uh, and other countries, we are. Not over, uh, like as a region, not as a country, but as a region, we still uh, do not reach over one percent of the uh, uh, export shares. So, given this, we have to uh, un unite our efforts, and uh, uh, in order to vocal our um, common aspirations, we have to uh, strengthen and intensify our regional integration processes. Uh, then, then the di diversification of partnerships. Uh, last year, we were seeing this uh, more interest in the Middle Eastern East uh, region. I think that the Middle East is also important, especially given that Saudi Arabia is opening uh, towards uh, it, it, it opening its economy. Uh, we have uh, good uh, perspective there. We have uh, continued to develop our partnership networks with, with our existing partners, partners like uh, Turkey, Japan, South Korea and the other countries, uh, not um, 
and then uh, we should also include the countries of uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, it's the, the uh, partnership with the Southeast Asian is mostly, um, it's not neglect, but it's uh, significant, limit, limited in comparison to other regions. And I think that the Southeast Asian, uh, Southeast Asian uh, region has a uh, very good potential and capacity. And uh, uh, we also think uh, to diversify our uh, partnership networks towards this uh, direction as well. So this was my major um, overview of the situation in the world nowadays. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Muratbekova. <clears throat> uh, I suppose uh, we can move to the section of questions and answers and also comments. Dear colleagues, dear friends, dear guests, if you have questions, comments, and suggestions, uh, you can take the floor. Yes. May I ask? Yes, a you can. Go, you can go on. Thanks, Andy. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, when we look at the topic, it looks uh, a book, uh, covering the broad area, but you give us a lot of details that. Uh, portrayed the possibly the Muslim parts in the big picture also. Uh, what I am interested in that I have so if I'm not misunderstood that uh, more and more African countries are becoming abstain about the conflict between the Ukraine and Russia and if so uh, what is the motivation over the political motivation with the Russia's influence is increasing? or they are uh, using China's influence over there. As we know that China is for a decade, maybe even more than that, uh, increasing its influence uh, mostly by economic relations. Yeah, shortly, my question is, uh, what is the reason between the African states think abstain? Is it returning to the neutral policy or just because of some internal influence? Can I answer? Thank you, Genghis Khan. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, the situation with the African states is that uh, they are abstaining. So uh, they were traditionally abstaining. So before, during the Cold War, they were traditional allies of Russia, of the USSR, and now they are. Uh, the trend is that they are coming back again. This situation, the thing is why they are abstaining is that mostly re related to their interest to captivize from this situation. So I don't uh, relate this situation with this Chinese influence or the Russian influence. The, I think that uh, by abstaining, so because Africa is uh, too far from Russia and uh, uh, basically they are, haven't got any threats coming from Russia, they, they are by uh, neutralizing their positions uh, in the conflict, they are trying to capitalize more benefit, economic benefits from this process. So we are seeing that uh, Putin had visited African countries, Lukashenko had visited these countries, so they are had enlarging the cooperation with African countries to this uh, for Russia. Uh, African market became a new market and uh, so they are trying to use the situation and uh, to and economically benefit by uh, being neutral uh, in the uh, in this uh, world uh, in these structures. Thank you. Thank you for answering. Okay. okay. Anyone else? Is there any question or comment? Arkadaşlar Türkçe de sorabiliriz. Ee, Türkistan'dan gelen stajyerlerimiz e, Kazakça, Rusça soraklarınızı sorabilirsiniz. Var mı? If there's no can ask another. Okay. Then uh, let me ask one more question. Dr. Murat Bekova. <clears throat> mm, yeah, you said uh, whatever happens, China wins. This is very striking. Actually, you quoted this uh, sentence, I think, but it's very striking uh, sentence or uh, scene, I don't know. 
Anyway, uh, you also mentioned uh, about the lessons and suggestions for Europe and also Central Asian countries, uh, such as you know, uh, continuation of the multilateral uh, relations and the intensification of the uh, regional uh, relations, uh, the relations between the countries of the, uh, Central Asia, and uh, yeah, etc. Uh, but uh, my question. Uh, in a very narrow sense, uh, what lessons uh, should uh, the Central Asian countries, Central Asian states, take in terms of security policies? I mean, uh, for example, uh, what do you think? Uh, are they going to revive or revise their security relations uh, on uh, the dependencies on Russia and China? Or how can they do this? Thank you very much for your question. I think, first of all, uh, Central Asia, in particular Kazakhstan, had already uh, reconsidered its defense uh, strategy. So we have our own, uh, so all the Central Asian states uh, last year was uh, quite hard in terms of their internal security policies because each country had their own uh, problems. In particular, our case was the most uh, famous one with uh, the uh, inviting the um, uh, peacekeepers from the CSTO. Uh, so this all showed this our uh, uh, the capabilities of our own uh, defense uh, structures. So in terms of this, uh, I guess that uh, cent uh, um, so all Central Asian states are working towards reforming uh, and transforming their uh, defense structures. So we see the trend of uh, increasing their budgets. But however, by increasing the budgets, it doesn't uh, say that we can. Um, we can stand against the other major powers. So what we are doing nowadays is that we are working, developing our um, uh, works uh, within the international organizations such as CSTO, uh, which has its RATS, uh, anti-terrorist uh, structures and the other international security, uh, international organizations. Uh, but also we are also developing bilateral cooperations. For instance, with India, we have very good, like having a common uh, Soviet legacy and the, ha uh, having more or less common uh, Soviet um, structure of uh, in defense structure. They have a very good cooperation. They are um, increasing this cooperation, but we also have an, ex I'm not uh, like, of course we have a very uh, deep and um, uh, interlinked relations with Russian defense uh, structure and system, including uh, like both internal and external uh, strategies, but uh, in general, uh, we also have diversified our uh, different defense uh, strategies toward the other countries. For instance, we are learning from different uh, uh, systems like cyber uh, security and other spheres from the EU and the US. And uh, we also have been uh, developing, um, trying to uh, to learn from China the, from the cyber security system. So all the system, uh, helps us to advance our own uh, defense uh, structure. So it it's it take, took place here in Kazakhstan and uh, in Uzbekistan, and I believe other small countries like Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan are also implying. However, at present uh, they have other uh, more um, more important uh, um, challenges like the Afghanistan case. So yes, we have, besides this uh, process is ongoing, we still have the situation instability in Afghanistan, which also uh, uh, like uh, directly uh, impact to the stability and security of our region. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any question? I, I have a question. Okay, uh, hang on. Dr. Murad Beko, thank you so much for the interesting presentation. So you mentioned uh, many important things, ch changes in uh, global politics. One point that you raised is uh, reforming of the United Nations. How do you think who can reform or transform this system? And don't you think that great powers are interested in keeping this format, to keeping the UN weak in order to conduct their policy and achieve their geopolitical goals? 
Thank you very much for your question. Uh, personally, I think uh, that uh, at the present conditions, uh, it is a bit. It will be very difficult to reform or transform the UN. However, uh, the problem with the UN and the, uh, nowadays, well, I think, is this uh, is about the leadership of the UN. So uh, the um, attempts taken by the present general secretary, UN general secretary uh, Antonio Guterres, was not enough uh, in mediating this uh, conflict or in uh, impacting to the uh, the situation in Ukraine. I think this uh, the problem nowadays we are facing, if we were, uh, like uh, five years ago, we were speaking about strongman era, about the rise of the strong uh, leaderships uh, of, the, of different countries. On the other hand, we are uh, see, uh, experiencing nowadays the weakening of the uh, leadership within the UN system. So this is my answer. Спасибо большое, доктор Радбекова, за интересный доклад. Мне интересен вопрос, вот когда начались все эти политические преобразования, война, да, события, Казахстан отводился очень интересной роль и говорил, что Казахстан сможет пересмотреть многие вещи в отношении своей внешней политики, да, обороноспособности страны, что Казахстан имеет уникальную возможность пересмотреть многие международные договора, в первую очередь выход из многих не совсем равноценных договоров, которые были заключены с Россией, и что Казахстан имеет уникальный шанс через международные организации, такие страны, как США, Германия, Китай, пересмотреть более на равноценных таких правах, пересмотреть. Но прошел год уже с тех пор. Считаете ли вы, что Казахстан прикладывает достаточно усилий, чтобы пересмотреть свою политику в области обороноспособности, энергетических ресурсов, их экспорт на зарубежный рынок и многие другие вещи связаны с этим, потому что внутри, находясь внутри общества, к сожалению, мы испытываем достаточно большой нехватку дефицит информации, потому что неизвестно, до сколько средств выделяется на пересмотр этой стратегии, закуп различных вещей, способных повысить обороноспособность страны. К сожалению, мы этого не видим, и у нас государственная власть, то есть самый президент в своих посланиях, обращениях, в других выступлениях об этом не упоминает. Спасибо большое. Спасибо за вопрос, Ламас. I will reply in Russian and I will, okay, then I will briefly explain in English. Спасибо за вопрос, Ламас. Ну, лично я считаю, что такой задачей, чтобы выйти из различных проектов, в которых участвует Казахстан наравне или не наравне с Россией, Казахстан ставит такой, ну, ставила такой целью выйти из этих проектов. Во-первых, это геополитически не совсем будет мудрым решением. Потому что кроме российской угрозы у нас существует еще ряд других факторов, которые также влияют на нашу внешнюю политику. Поэтому, как я говорила в презентации, я считаю, что вот политика мультивекторности, которую мы, мы придерживаемся, это самый наиболее эффективный вариант в текущей ситуации, и учитывая наше не только геополитическое, но еще и экономическое положение, опираясь на наши потенциал и наши как бы, ресурсы, мы должны следовать мультивекторному пути. Что хорошо с Казахстаном, то, то что мы не делаем акцент на одну страну. То есть в нашей мультивекторной политике существует несколько регионов и несколько стран, которыми, которых мы считаем основными своими партнерами. В этом плане ну, наша дипломатия, я считаю, что двигается в очень правильном направлении. Я не думаю, что у нас целесообразно выходить из разных существующих вот архитектур, ну, вот существующих схем, допустим, да, различных международных организаций. Uh, усилит ли роль, uh, ну, возможно, если мы как страна будем развиваться и внутренне uh, усиливать свою экономику, свои, свою индустрию и так далее, то мы можем больше предъявлять для всего мира, uh, не только потому, что мы находимся между uh, большими странами. Да? Uh, второй вопрос про... про влияние оборон, на оборону, на экспорт и так далее. Да, я считаю, что с прошлого года наши 
Наше правительство уже пересмотрело значимость, ну, больше это, конечно, относится к нашим январским событиям, но, тем не менее, я считаю, что они начали реформировать всю силовую структуру нашего государства. Тем не менее, задачи равняться или как-то пытаться быть равным России, я считаю, что нет. Нужно учитывать, что Россия все-таки это номер страна, у которой самый высокий потенциал по этому пеши, как пеши, да? США, это, 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 армия США номер один в, по, в морской сфере, а Россия, вот, как называется? Пехота, Здесь, сухопутные пехота, войска. Да, да, сухопутные войска, да. да. Вот по сухопутным войскам Россия номер один в мире, выше, чем Китай статистически на сегодняшний день. Поэтому, считая, учитывая, что с одной стороны у нас Китай, который в 2040 году пытается стать э, армией номер один в мире, и Россия, которая уже является армией, именно сухопутные войска считается номер один в мире, э, нам еще ну, очень много работать нужно в этой сфере. Спасибо. So the uh, Almas question was about the Kazakhstan's positions. Uh, should we use the situation with Ukrainian conflict and uh, go away from this uh, international organizations where we have an unbalanced position with Russia? And I'm replying that no, we haven't got such an attempt uh, overall. So we are uh, having this uh, multi-vector policy and we are uh, by following this uh, multi-vector policy is a very wisdom decision for our government. And uh, so uh, in general, there is no, not any tasks uh, to go away from this uh, organizations we are, which is led by Russia. The second question was about should we strengthen our defense to counterattack or to combat to, 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 to against Russia and other uh, major powers and I'm saying no, again we are still reforming our military spheres but uh, we have to remind that uh, we have one neighbor which is China which once by 2040 became uh, number one uh, army in the world and uh, from the other hand we has we have Russia which is already number one um, army in terms of its uh, of its army so we need to of course develop and transform but uh, we still need to work a lot in this direction okay thank you almost thank you Alvina. I think uh, we have uh, uh, from Kabalji uh, Professor Kabalji. Hocam, can you hear me? Yes, it's okay. And I want to thank you for the nice presentation to Murat Bek. So as uh, Murat Bek mentioned several steps about from the renewable energy, uh, solar cell uh, products, uh, and also uh, regional integration. I have a question. In the last two decades, uh, uh, we have a lot of exchange mobility between the Central Asia students, academic uh, uh, persons, uh, academic uh, researcher between the two sides. Uh, could you see uh, how does this uh, exchange mobility give a direction uh, to become much more integration between the Central Asia uh, uh, products Uh, from the culture and uh, for future planning. Uh, uh, is there a uh, 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 accountable uh, development between the two sides, Central Asia community and the uh, uh, Turkish side? This is the first question. About And the second question is that, uh, as I uh, uh, noticed that, between the Central Asia government, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, it has also nice university. But uh, for the future, Uh, what could be done in extra to develop the uh, main research fields like uh, uh, photovoltaic products, electronics uh, devices, and uh, like uh, energy-based uh, uh, devices. Uh, how can we uh, invest the uh, uh, young generation uh, 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 intention to develop the much more strength uh, infrastructure laboratory facilities? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your question. In terms of the first question, Central Asian uh, Turkey collaboration uh, in terms of uh, renewable energy, I could say that yes, uh, steps has, has been done. However, uh, the overall the developments uh, towards the renewable energy in Kazakhstan has been uh, developing slower than might be than in other parts of the world. 
Uh, one of the reasons might be that the prices. So we haven't we haven't got any uh, like uh, accessibility of this. Uh, so we have cheap uh, gas and cheap energy, and all these things also imp impact. So uh, so for transforming towards this uh, renewable energy uh, industry, first of all, we need a budget. So uh, the during the last years, uh, the EU has been trying, and the, the World Bank has try, uh, has. Um, been trying to invest to our economies in order to to help the transformation but during this the the large the last meetings for instance during the uh, the last uh, climate change conference uh, the central asian governments were all uh, saying about the one thing so in order to transform to towards the renewable energy we need the funding so the problem number one in kazakhstan is a lack of funding for for the transformations towards this uh, renewable energy uh, turkey yes uh, it's one of the uh, like desirable markets uh, where we can also to produce jointly or export from Turkey these products because uh, Turkey is more advanced in comparison to us. But still, yes, uh, since we have already uh, cheap prices, uh, cheap energy prices, there is no any intention um, and to incentivize these processes. In terms of uh, university cooperation and the main research infrastructure, this is what, what we are uh, di discussing all the time. So the um, uh the government which before like the research uh budget if before the government was seeing about the increase and nowadays we are facing seeing um, on the contrary decrease so uh we know that there is a uh, very huge um uh, limitation in our research infrastructure so uh of course uh in kazakhstan as far as i know we have uh, in terms of renewable energy i think we have the kazakh uh, german university which has a special de uh, department on these environmental studies uh they are having good projects with the european union sites but i don't know other partners but still they are working on this direction they have this water uh sustainability uh environmental system and other issues but uh they are working on rlc and other uh, things but still we still uh in a, um, uh, we have a deficit of these uh, research infrastructures in terms of developing these uh, renewable energy products. So uh, Turkey, of course, could be a very good um, partner in this uh, uh, direction. And uh, if jointly, uh, so so far we are uh, together with Turkey. We are uh, more focusing on the cultural, humanitarian, and historical. Uh, cooperation uh, so if we turn in terms of researching and if we turn in uh, to the other like uh, technical directions uh, like in this uh, renewable energy i think we uh, both sides could win from these processes i hope i had answered your question okay i think yes you do uh, if there is uh, any further question uh, I think we can uh, complete our seminar. Is there? No, okay. Uh, for uh, her well-designed presentation, uh, thank uh, Dr. Murat Bekova and also all of you. Uh, we thank you for your participation and for your contribution. Uh, see you at our next event. Uh, stay well. Hope to see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.